First of all, he showed up drunk to the coffee shop we agreed to meet at, like full-on stumbling, slurring his words about to pass out drunk. The only reason why we weren't kicked out is because I'm friends with the owner of the shop and they gave us a secluded booth. I had to help him sit down and had to order his coffee for him. I got flashbacks from when I was younger and had to help him back to his bed or the couch after he came back in the middle of the night, having gambled and drunk all our money away. He was barely coherent and kept on talking about some random butt shoot I couldn't even decipher. I considered just leaving him there, but decided that if this is the last time we meet, I'm going to get some answers. After half an hour and five cups of coffee, he sobered up enough to have a coherent thought and asked how I was doing. I couldn't even believe he was asking me that. I just ignored that and demanded to know what the hell he's been up to the past decade and why he never came back. He went on tangents and side stories, but managed to explain everything I wanted to know. I was right. I hated the answers I got. It would have been easier to just continue blaming him my entire life, but what actually happened has fricked me over so hard. He started with his childhood, and I guess that's a decent beginning on why he's so messed up. It was shitty, apparently. He was abused in every way there was, by both the other kids and the adults. He didn't have anyone, and the moment he turned 18, he joined the army to get away from them. There he had a purpose, people to look out for. He said that they were his real family and he would have protected them with this life. James was one of them. He described the moment he first saw James, pompous and arrogant because of his family's money, and knew that he wouldn't be able to survive there without help. He took James under his wing and helped make him into the man he is today. He was honorably discharged after a few years and was given an opportunity to start a new life. He was working at a gym when he met my mother. She was yelling at some guy for trying to get handsy with her, and when it started to get physical, my dad was about to step in when she knocked him out clean. She didn't get in trouble because the cops said it was self-defense. She later asked my dad why he didn't step in earlier, and he said it looked like she had it handled. She asked how he knew, and he told her that the other guy was sloppy, and while she was way smaller than him, her stance and movements told him that he could kick his butt. She asked him out right after, and according to him, the best years of his life followed. She understood him and gave him reason to believe that not everyone was a shitty person. They moved in together into her place at the five-month mark, and six months later, found out she was pregnant. They had a shotgun wedding, since neither had family they were close to and just a few friends they trusted. I was easy enough for my mom during the pregnancy and labor, but not after, apparently. She developed postpartum depression and was overwhelmed with me. My dad helped her as much as he could, but also had to go to work to continue paying the bills and for her medication. He tried to get her to see someone, but she refused due to the cost. When I was about seven months old, she ended the life of herself by overdosing on her meds. When my dad got home and found her body, he immediately blamed me. It wasn't logical, but in his mind, I had taken away the one person he truly loved with all his heart by simply being born. When he explained it to me and told me how my mother ended the life of herself because of me, I understood. I got that if she never had me, both of them would have been living their best lives right now. I can't blame him for wanting to do nothing with me afterwards. A lot of my anger dissipated after he told me that I looked exactly like her and that every time he looked at me, it was a reminder of her. After that, he moved to a shadier part of town with me and gave the local kids scraps and change in order to take care of me while he went out. They kept me alive long enough until I was two and he got whatever woman he was seeing to look after me. That went on until I was seven and he thought I was old enough to take care of myself. I wasn't and told him as much, but he just shrugged me off and responded with, you didn't die or anything. As long as you were in one piece, it was fine. I really wanted to punch him and got to the point on where he was the past 10 years and why he came back now. Apparently, he did some stints in prison for aggravated attack and was either passing out in alleyways or managed to hook up with a woman 
and stayed at her place for a few weeks before she kicked him out. He was traveling when he found an old picture he had of me and my mom when I was born. That's when he called James and told him about me. He then tried to rob some rich family's house and got put away for 15 years. He got out on parole and thought it would be a good idea to try and meet me again. I asked why and he said he didn't need a reason to want to meet his kid. I told him he lost the right to call me his kid after everything that has happened and he told me to cut him some slack. That his shitty childhood and losing his wife because of me messed him up and he wasn't thinking straight. But he was back and wanted to reconnect again. I didn't know how to get out of this without either beating him up or just crying in the bathroom and I tried to be calm and told him that I understood what he was trying to say and that I'd be in contact about where this could go. He agreed and gave me a hug. I just wanted to get it over with and let him. I don't know why, but I started to panic and started shaking during it, and after he let me go, I threw up in the bathroom and basically had a nervous breakdown in my car. I managed to drive home and slept the entire rest of the day and half of the next. I only came to when James told me my boyfriend was here to check up on me. This was a day ago, and I'm typing this while my boyfriend is sleeping next to me. I got the answers I had been waiting my whole life for, but they messed me up even more. I still don't know what to do and feel like everything is crumbling. My biological father still wants to have a relationship, and I'm doubting my whole stance on this being a one-time thing. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment 1. Big hugs. He sounds like a whole dang mess. Truth is, the two adults in your life weren't strong enough to care for themselves, let alone you, a child. You deserved better. Does their past experiences mean nothing? No, but when a child is involved, they take priority. Mom should have gotten help. Dad should have been around and abiding by the laws. They let a lot of their problems fall into your lap, and that just isn't okay. I'm sorry. You deserve the time to decide what you want to do and how you want to proceed. Either way, there is no wrong choice, only what you are happy with. If it was me, I'd stay a bit distanced and not get my hopes up to bond much with him, but maybe I wouldn't banish him either. Wouldn't trust him with my heart or in my house, though. Big, big hugs. Surround yourself with people you love and trust to help support you during this. Comment 2. My mother ended the life of herself because of me. I understood. I got that if she never had me, both of them would have been living their best lives right now. I can't blame him for wanting to do nothing with me afterwards. No, you are not going to blame yourself for this. If we use his logic, it means if he never had unprotected intimacy with your mom, she would be alive. That's not on you. Honestly, your mom needed help, but him and her didn't have the opportunity to get that help. That's the system's fault. Your mom didn't unalive herself because of you. Don't you even dare to blame yourself. Also, my suggestion is to stay away from him. You don't need a burden like him. Just like you were a burden to him when you were a kid, today he is ten times worse a burden for you. I think you should start to see a professional. Wish you all the best. Now, for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for all the comments on my last post. I really appreciated the support and advice. A lot has happened since then, and I need to get it off my chest. So, after that disaster of a meeting with my dad, things took a turn I didn't expect. My boyfriend, who's been my rock through all of this, suggested we take a weekend trip to clear my head. I agreed, thinking it would help me process everything. But as we were packing, my phone buzzed with a text from James. He wanted to meet up urgently. I was hesitant, but my curiosity got the better of me. We met at a park, away from prying eyes. James looked serious, which was unusual for him. He's always been the laid-back type, ever since we were kids, and he'd come over to escape his own family drama. He told me he'd been talking to my dad after our coffee shop fiasco. Apparently, my dad had been reaching out to him over the years, trying to make amends for past mistakes. James had kept it from me, thinking it was for the best. I was angry at first, feeling betrayed by James. But then he dropped a bombshell. My dad had been sending money to James for me, a sort of informal child support. James had set it aside, not wanting to influence my feelings towards my dad. There was a decent sum, enough to make a difference in my life. I was stunned. 
My dad, the man who'd abandoned me, had been trying to provide for me in his own messed up way. The confrontation with James was intense. We argued, voices raised, attracting stares from people walking by. But in the end, we reached a compromise. James would transfer the money to me, and I would consider what to do about my dad without the pressure of financial strings attached. Back home, my boyfriend was waiting with open arms. He listened as I poured out the whole story, the anger, the confusion, the unexpected twist. He held me as I cried, the weight of years of pent-up emotions finally breaking free. The next few weeks were a blur. I used some of the money to pay off debts and put the rest into savings. It felt weird, using the money my dad had sent, but it also felt like a small piece of justice, a tiny bit of reparation for the years of neglect. My boyfriend and I went on that weekend trip and it was like a breath of fresh air. We hiked, talked, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like I could breathe. He's always been there for me, ever since we met in high school. He was the new kid, shy and awkward, and I was the tough girl with a chip on her shoulder. We clicked, and he's been my best friend and partner ever since. But the story doesn't end there. My dad reached out again, asking to meet. I was torn. Part of me wanted to scream at him, to reject him like he'd rejected me. But another part of me was curious. Who was this man, really? Could there be more to him than the failures of the past? I agreed to meet him, but this time on my terms. We met at a public park, neutral ground. He was sober, which was a relief. We talked, really talked, for the first time ever. He shared stories of his life, the good and the bad. He talked about his regrets, his hopes, and how he wanted to be part of my life, even if it was just as a distant figure. I listened, taking it all in. It was overwhelming, hearing about his life, the choices he'd made, and the consequences that followed. He wasn't asking for forgiveness, just a chance to be present in whatever way I was comfortable with. I left that meeting with a lot to think about. My boyfriend and I discussed it at length, weighing the pros and cons. It was a decision I never thought I'd have to make. Husband accidentally calls me by our friend's name during intimate moment. And then I find out Monica has been trying to sabotage our relationship. Oh boy, throwaway account. My husband and I have been together for six years, married for two. We have a great relationship, absolutely no complaints. We communicate well and our intimacy life is really healthy. My husband has a best friend we'll call her Monica. We're all in our mid-30s. They've known each other for over a decade. I love Monica. She's become one of my best friends since I started dating my husband. She was a bridesmaid when we got married and we've discussed making her the godmother of our children. We all go to dinner a few times a month, sometimes the three of us, and sometimes with other friends. We've tried to set her up with a few of our guy friends. Once in a while, my husband and her will go just the two of them if I'm busy and can't make it. And sometimes it's just Monica and me. I have never once felt like Monica was anything but family. Tonight, we hung out with Monica and a few other friends at a mutual friend's housewarming party. The three of us went to dinner before and talked all night like usual. My husband has a habit of initiating intimacy with me in his sleep. He never remembers beginning it, and he is almost a different person when this happens, not in a bad way. He just uses completely different vernacular than he normally would, and he's a lot more aggressive. I like it. It's always fun, and we usually laugh about whatever crazy thing he said to me while he was sleep sexing me. Tonight started out the same way. He was grabbing me all over and talking dirty to me in his sleep, and then as he's fondling my breasts and grinding his weenie into my butt, he calls me Monica like four times in a row. I was so shocked. I froze. I tried to initiate intimacy again to see if he'd call me her name again, but he ended up waking up and I told him what had just happened. I got up and went to the living room. I can't sleep. He followed me and we had a chat about it. He profusely apologized and swears he's not attracted to her and nothing has ever happened between them. He would have been just as shocked if he had called me by one of his real sister's names. He assumes it's because we were with her tonight and that was in his subconscious. I believe my husband. I have seen a few of my husband's exes before and I'm definitely very his type and he always makes me feel beautiful and wanted. I also know Monica's type and it's definitely not my husband. 
How do I process this and how can I move forward? This is all coming a few days after I've had my second miscarriage confirmed as well. I'm feeling very tender and depressed right now. WTF. Edit update. This got way more comments than I expected, so I'll just put a little update here. Thanks everyone for your intimacy dream stories and stories of calling loved ones by the wrong name. After writing this out and getting a few great comments off the bat, I felt so much better. Y'all are right, we can't control our dreams, and sometimes our brains are a wild place. I once had an intimacy dream about John C. Riley that haunts me to this day, ha ha ha. I went back to bed after that, and in the morning, my husband was so relieved that I was in a good mood. We had a laugh about it, and then had a great day. I didn't realize the sexomnia would be such a talking point, ha. Huh? Like we've all established, the subconscious is a wild place to be. Happy New Year. Now for a few comments before the update. Comment 1. After reading some explicit material, I had a dream that I had intimate relations with my 70-year-old neighbor. I was quite disturbed when I woke up but I want to assure you that I have no desire whatsoever to engage in any kind of relationship with him. Dreams can be strange and shouldn't be interpreted too seriously. Your husband has not shown any signs of being interested in her, and don't listen to those who claim he has already been involved with her. Comment 2. It's completely understandable that you feel a certain way about this, but it's important to remember that dreams are uncontrollable and mostly random. I once had a lengthy conversation with a floor lamp while I was asleep. Given the circumstances, I believe that he simply had a mix-up in his mind, and this dream doesn't hold any significant meaning. Now for the update. Hey everyone, I'm back with another update, and wow, do I have some news to share. First off, thanks for all the comments on my last post. They really helped me put things into perspective. So let's dive into what's been happening these past two weeks. After the whole Monica incident during my husband's sleep-initiated escapade, things were a bit awkward, but we managed to laugh it off. We chalked it up to his subconscious being a little too active after spending the evening with her. But that's not where the story ends. Monica has been a constant in our lives for years and I've always trusted her implicitly. She's the one who helped me pick out my wedding dress after all. And when I had my first miscarriage, she was there with ice cream and movies, ready to distract me from the pain. So I never doubted her loyalty to our friendship or to my marriage. However, life has a funny way of throwing curveballs. Last week, my husband and I decided to host a small get-together at our place. Monica was, of course, on the guest list. The night was going well, everyone was enjoying themselves, and I was feeling a bit better after the emotional ride of the past few days. As the night wore on, I noticed Monica and my husband were nowhere to be seen. I figured they had stepped out to grab something from the store or were just catching up. But when I went to check on them, I found them in a heated argument in our guest room. I couldn't believe my ears when I heard Monica confessing her feelings for my husband. She was saying how she'd always loved him and how she thought they were meant to be together. My husband was firm telling her that he was committed to our marriage and that he loved me. He was shocked and upset by her confession. I burst into the room and the look on Monica's face was one of pure guilt. She tried to apologize, saying she'd had too much to drink and didn't know what she was saying. But the damage was done. I was devastated. The trust I had in both of them was shattered. My husband and I had a long talk after everyone left. He reassured me that he had no idea Monica felt this way and that he had never encouraged her. He was just as blindsided as I was. We decided to take a break from Monica to put some distance between us while we worked on our relationship. It was a tough decision, especially considering how close we all were, but it seemed like the right thing to do for the health of our marriage. Just when I thought things couldn't get any more complicated, I found out I was pregnant again. The news was bittersweet given everything that had happened. My husband and I were overjoyed, but also cautious, given our history with miscarriages. We decided to keep the news to ourselves for now, not wanting to add any more stress to our already strained situation. We focused on each other, trying to rebuild the trust and intimacy that had been shaken by the recent events. Then, two days ago, I received a message from Monica. She wanted to meet up and talk, 
to explain herself. Against my better judgment, I agreed. We met at a coffee shop and she poured her heart out. She told me about how she'd been struggling with her feelings for years, how she'd always felt like the third wheel in our relationship. She admitted that she'd been trying to sabotage our relationship, hoping that my husband would turn to her. She even confessed to being the one who had sent anonymous messages to my husband's exes, trying to stir up trouble between us. I was floored. I couldn't believe the length she'd gone to, all because of her unrequited love for my husband. I left the coffee shop feeling a mix of anger and pity for Monica. She had been such a big part of our lives, and to find out she'd been working against us was heartbreaking. When I got home, I told my husband everything. We were both in shock. We knew we had to confront Monica together and put an end to this once and for all. We invited her over, and the confrontation was intense. Monica broke down, apologizing for everything she'd done. She said she would seek help and that she would stay away from us for good. My husband and I are now trying to move forward, to focus on the future and the new life we're bringing into the world. It's going to be a long road to recovery, but we're determined to get through this together. Father-in-law tells me to f off in group chat after I ask mother-in-law to pick up some cookies. Seven months later, I get a half-hearted apology email. Father-in-law went full hostile at me in a group chat because I asked mother-in-law, with whom I was super close with, if she could pick up some cookies for me next time she went to Costco. The group chat had me, my husband, mother-in-law, and father-in-law. I don't remember what he said exactly anymore, just that the sentiment was mean-spirited and personally directed at me. We always paid mother-in-law back for anything she picked up for us, and we return the favor whenever we can and whenever she asks. She always promised my husband and I anything you need, anytime, and she often said it was her pleasure, especially since she can squeeze quick visits with the kids when she dropped off stuff for us. This matters because at first my husband thought father-in-law was being hostile because he thought we were harassing mother-in-law, which wasn't the case. Husband saw the tirade first and responded with an explanation of our setup with mother-in-law, and he gave an out for father-in-law to take it back. But father-in-law doubled down more aggressively instead. I saw it next and was shocked with the hostility. Mother-in-law saw it an hour or so later and was immediately mad. I have since left the group chat and deleted the chat because I kept rereading and crying over what he said to me and it was destroying my sense of self-worth. I have a disability and father-in-law went after me for it, basically. As I reread his messages, I was repeatedly internalizing his attack and convincing myself it was my fault he went after me. Husband supporting me in correcting my thought tangent, and it's still ongoing. Anyway, the whole thing really messed me up. I turned off my text notifications and buried my message app in some random folder. Just the thought of father-in-law messaging me again caused me so much anxiety and hyperacidity. For as long as I've known my husband, even when we were still dating, father-in-law would do and say hurtful things. And the family would shrug it off and convince ourselves that he was just joking. And we would stew awkwardly pretending like nothing happened until we could go home once the tension gets too much or everyone satisfied some polite length of stay. This was what my husband, brother-in-law, and mother-in-law did when I joined the family, and I have been following their SOP for 18 years up until this particular event. There was no tricking ourselves. Father-in-law was just joking this time. So I decided to distance myself from father-in-law and also mother-in-law by association. Mother-in-law was mad enough that even though father-in-law is the type to perpetually refuse this, and like any travel to non-English speaking countries because he wouldn't be in full control of things, she got him to cooperate with couples counseling and even personal therapy. I guess he was so deep in the doghouse that he was forced to be uncharacteristically pliant. Couples counseling, personal therapy, and later a trip to somewhere not English speaking. It's been seven months since all that happened. While I was deleting the accumulated spam in my inbox yesterday, I found an email father-in-law sent way back in November. Immediately I felt off with it. It felt completely canned, 
like a task that needed done to prove he was trying. And maybe I'm just so jaded that I also think he did it so that if I wasn't receptive, I was the obstinate and unforgiving one. This is what I got from it. He's sorry I got hurt. He doesn't really think he went after me personally, but he's sorry because I misunderstood his intentions and he unintentionally hurt me. He seems more sorry he got in trouble with his wife and frustrated with the fallout and therapy he has to endure though. He regrets what happened, but only because it landed him in hot water, so he really won't do it again and he wants me to forgive him soon for the family so he could go back to his normal life. Like my forgiveness will be his get out of jail free card. And if I withhold forgiveness, the strain on the family would be my fault. Anyway, the email just left me feeling upset and frustrated in ways I find hard to articulate well. It felt like he was using the family as leverage against me. His actual email, I would much rather do this in person, but that is not an option at this time. I have been hesitating sending this to you as I do not want to make things any worse than they currently are. Firstly, I want to sincerely apologize to you for upsetting and hurting you as I did. It was never my intention, and it was not a personal attack on you in any way. Although you may not see it that way, it was not my intention, and I'm very sorry that it came across that way. I know I hurt you, and I cannot change that. I can only say sorry I did that to you. You are important to me. I understand that I interfered in a situation that was none of my business. It will not happen again. If I could turn back the clock, I would not have put myself in a situation that had nothing to do with me. I have spent many hours reflecting on the event. I know I cannot change what happened. I can only apologize for my actions and the hurt it has caused you. I too am struggling with this whole situation as it is. I too am upset over my actions and the strain it has caused between all of us, but mostly between you and I. I would like us to be able to be a family again. You are an important part of this family, my family. I am seeking counseling for myself, to better myself and be better for our family. I need to be better for everyone that I care about, including you. I wish this could be said in person. I hope that we can eventually put this behind us and move forward together as a whole family. Again, I sincerely apologize to you. I know you are not ready to deal with me I understand. I hope that one day in the near future we can sit down together so I can say sorry in person. You matter to me. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment one, I don't know exactly what was said, so I'm gonna give him some benefit of the doubt. People are messy, and if we wait for perfect, we're going to wait a really long time. I think the email was fair. He did take some measure of blame, said he wished he never did it and will not do it again, that you are important to him and understands he needs to do better for all. I would really be interested if he followed through with counseling because that is a big step. OP, Reddit is a place where very little grace is given. If father-in-law came on here and said his version of the text story showed the email he sent, you would be the villain of the story. Talk to your husband and get his thoughts, but I would give father-in-law a chance. Comment two. Girl, this was so much better than I was expecting. And honestly, while not perfect, I would say this is a good apology letter. I get given your history why you're having the reaction you are. But saying he didn't intend to hurt you and saying you misunderstood him are not the same thing. I don't know how despicable what he initially said to you was, so I obviously don't have the full picture, but this reads to me as a very honest and respectful apology. He reiterated how important you are to him several times and made it clear he understands you need your space. Honest question without judgment from me. What would you need from him in an apology that you're not getting here? Now for the update. A lot has happened since the last time I posted about the whole mess with my father-in-law. I wish I could say things have gotten better, but brace yourselves, because this update is a doozy. After father-in-law's half-hearted email apology, I was already on edge. My husband, bless his heart, tried to mediate things, but it was like trying to put out a fire with a water pistol. Mother-in-law, who I used to be super close with, was caught in the middle. She was still making efforts to see us and the kids, but the tension was thick enough to cut with a knife. Now, let's rewind a bit to give you some context. 
Before all this blew up, my relationship with father-in-law had always been rocky. He had this way of making snide remarks that everyone would just laugh off. I remember this one time, early in my marriage, when he made a joke about my cooking at a family dinner. Everyone chuckled, but I saw the look in my husband's eyes. He was mortified. We never talked about it, but it was clear that this was the norm in their family. Just grin and bear it. Fast forward to two weeks ago. My husband and I were at mother-in-law's house helping her with some yard work. It was a nice day and I was starting to feel like maybe we could get past all the drama. That's when father-in-law showed up, unannounced. He had this look on his face like he was ready to start World War III. He walked straight up to me and I braced myself for another attack. But instead, he said he wanted to talk, alone. My husband looked like he wanted to protest, but I nodded. Maybe this was it, the heartfelt apology I'd been waiting for. We sat down on the porch, and he started off by reiterating what he said in the email. But then he dropped a bombshell. He admitted that he had always been jealous of the relationship I had with mother-in-law. He felt like I had taken his place as her confidant, and that I was the favorite child. I was floored. This was the root of all the hostility. I didn't know what to say. I tried to explain that I never intended to come between them, but he wasn't having it. He said that he saw how his actions had hurt me, but he couldn't promise he wouldn't feel that way again. It was like he was apologizing and retracting it in the same breath. The conversation ended with him standing up abruptly and saying he needed time to think. I was left sitting there, feeling more confused and heartbroken than ever. I thought we were making progress, but it was clear that father-in-law still harbored resentment towards me. When I told my husband what happened, he was furious. He confronted father-in-law, and they had a shouting match right there in the backyard. Mother-in-law was crying, begging them to stop. It was a scene straight out of a drama show. My husband stormed off, and I followed, leaving mother-in-law to console father-in-law. Since then, my husband and I have had long talks about what to do. We can't cut father-in-law out of our lives completely. He's still family after all. But we've agreed that we need to set some boundaries. For my own mental health, I can't be around that kind of negativity. Mother-in-law has been trying to play peacemaker, but it's clear she's torn between her husband and the rest of us. She's been sneaking over to see the kids, but each visit is bittersweet. We all know that things can't go on like this. Just yesterday, I thought I saw a glimmer of hope. Father-in-law sent another email, this time to both my husband and me. He said he was willing to try family therapy, something he had vehemently opposed before. But I'm wary. Is this just another tactic to get back into our good graces, or is he genuinely trying to change? I'm not sure where we go from here. The hurt runs deep and trust is shattered. But for the sake of our family, especially the kids, I'm willing to give it a shot. I just hope that father-in-law is as committed to mending fences as he says he is. If you like this video, you'll probably like these too. Also while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.